So welcome to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Christina Hamilton. I'm the series director. I want to say a special welcome to those of you who are watching this by live stream at one of the watch parties that's going on or on Detroit Public Television's website on their live stream. And a big welcome to all you radio listeners out there as you are tuning in on the extreme left of your dial at 88.3 WCBN FM Ann Arbor. <laughs> Today, we could not be more thrilled uh, to present, and finally present, uh, Congressman John Lewis. Uh, yeah. Oh, you guys. Uh, with Andrew Iden and Nate Powell, co-authors of the National Book Award-winning trilogy, March. Uh, and I want to thank our partners in this endeavor because this evening's program is indeed a co-presentation. Uh, this, this evening is being co-presented by the International Institute's Conflict and Peace Initiative, the King Chavez Park's Visiting Professors Program, uh, and with Detroit Public Television, our great partner, uh, in getting this event out to more people in the world than those of us that have been able to make it here today. Uh, and we had additional support from the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, the Department of Psychology, the Department of, no, sorry, Department of Political Science, the Institute for the Humanities, the National Center for International Diverse, Institutional Diversity, the Office of Community Engaged Academic Learning, Rackham Graduate School, and the Office of Research. It takes a lot of people to make things happen, as you can see. Uh, I want to mention to all of you that the Conflict and Peace Initiative is hosting a whole series of events, uh, uh, social justice events staged around this talk this evening. Uh, the final event in this series uh, is a Marching Forward Research and Scholarship Symposium, which is taking place this week on Wednesday at 4 p.m. on the 10th floor of the new Weiser Hall building. And all are welcome to attend this. There are flyers in the lobby. You can get more information. Uh, this is the first time that we've hosted a Penny Stamp Series event at Hill Auditorium. Uh, and a big thank you to Congressman Lewis and uh, Andrew Iden and Nate Powell, who were able to reschedule this date, which, you know, scheduling the first date wasn't easy, uh, canceling and the first date wasn't easy, and finding a date that worked for everyone to reschedule wasn't easy. So here we are, and it's a wonderful moment. And I thank them deeply for uh, sorting through all of that. Uh, I want to say to all of our students in the audience tonight, you never know what can happen to you when you go to see someone talk. I was recently reading a book by one of our great alumni, Larry Brilliant, uh, a gentleman who uh, left here from the University of Michigan to, and helped eradicate smallpox from the planet, and he also started a little something called Google. Uh, when he first showed up as a student to University of Michigan in his freshman year, he said he barricaded himself in his dorm room and wouldn't leave until he saw a tiny little notice in the Michigan Daily that said that Martin Luther King would be speaking at Hill Auditorium. And this was in November of 1962, 55 years ago this month. When he arrived at Hill Auditorium, there were only 100 people that came out to see Dr. King speak that day. Uh, so it's amazing to see what has happened since 55 years, because there's certainly more than 100 people in the house tonight. But I can tell you that Larry Brilliant said, yeah, Larry Brilliant said that when he saw Dr. King speak, he said, we were transfixed, time stopped, and no one was the, ever the same after that moment, and he never spent any more time in his dorm room. <laughs> so for those of you who are here who don't know what the Penny Stamp Series is, you have no idea, let me explain quickly. It's a, the Penny Stamp Series is a program of the Stamp School of Art and Design, which looks to present creative innovators who transcend tradition, like our guests today. It's a way for our students to uh, connect directly with creative leaders, and it's, it's also welcome, open to the public. It typically happens every Thursday at the Michigan Theater just down the street. Uh, so if you don't know about us and you want to join us more often, please do. You can go to pennystampsevents.org or join Penny Stamps uh, series on Facebook to get more information. This week on Thursday, we will hold one of our regular talks. We'll be bringing in a sculptor from South Africa, Justine Mahoney. She's going to talk about her work as a sculptor and how it's been influenced by growing up in Johannesburg, South Africa during a very violent time during apartheid. So please do join us. And I'm very pleased to also 
point out that our theme of the penny stamp season this year is e pluribus unum, which is Latin for many are one. Uh, and you know, most of us know this is the traditional motto of the United States appearing on the great seal and passports, the seal of the president, the seal of Congress, in fact. Uh, and it shows up on some of our money. Uh, but in these times of deepening division in our country, it's important to remember we are all in this together. So e pluribus unum, don't forget it. We will host a few uh, questions at the end of the stage presentation today, but this will not be our regular open mic Q&A. We have a mic down here, but there are so many students in classes across campus and beyond our campus who have been studying the March book in their classes, and uh, so we have pre-selected a few students uh, from the University of Michigan, also from Ypsilanti Community High School, and from the Youth Arts Alliance of Washtenaw County. Uh, those 10 know who they are, and when the moment arrives, uh, you can stand up at the microphone, and we all are eager to hear what you have to ask. Uh, there will be a book signing that is going to follow the event today. Vault of Midnight is out in the lobby selling books if you don't have one yet. The book signing is going to take place downstairs. You will want to enter that from the east side stairs, as the east side stairs will be the entrance and the west side stairs will be the exit. Uh, during the book signing, uh, as I'm sure there are many of you that want to get things signed, please do remember we want to keep it moving along. Uh, you get one signed item per person. They are only interested in signing one of the March books. Uh, and uh, please, I know everybody wants to get a selfie, but please do not ask the congressman to take a picture, nor ask him to stand or anything like that. If you want to surreptitiously get your moment, do it, but, but don't make it involved, okay? Uh, so the signing will be downstairs, enter from the east side staircase, and please do remember everyone to turn off your cell phones. And now I, for a proper introduction of Congressman Lewis and our guests today, you know, we had to get just the right man for the job. And you know, we found someone I think is pretty good. He is not a stranger to the civil rights arena. He is someone who also serves our fair institution. He's on our board of regents, where he's led the fight for tuition equality uh, through the Go Blue Guarantee, which begins next year, I might add. Uh, Mark Bernstein, he's an alumni from the University of Michigan. He is managing partner of the Sam Bernstein Law Firm. He previously served in the White House under President Clinton. Uh, he has served on the Michigan Civil Rights Commission as its longest serving member. During his tenure, he led a crackdown on hate groups, helped establish the Michigan Civil Rights Academy, and convened the Michigan Civil Rights Summit. He currently serves on the board of directors of Detroit Public Television, the executive board of the Michigan Association for Justice, and was elected by both defense and plaintiff attorneys to serve on the state bar of Michigan Negligence Council. Please welcome U of M Regent Mark Bernstein. Thank you, Christina. We all know we all know that the civil rights movement is far from over and never will be until we fully honor our aspirations for a more fair, just, and compassionate society. And that is why we are here tonight, to teach this fact and to celebrate the extraordinary work of Congressman John Lewis, Andrew Iden, and Nate Powell. Their collaboration the March Trilogy chronicles the civil rights movement in a powerful and captivating way. It exemplifies creativity at work in the world, the application of design to teach and transform. Indeed, the New York Times observed about the March Trilogy, and I quote, March is more movement blueprint than civil rights monument. It continued, quote, Young people deserve a future in which they can conceive of their own participation, and this requires a past that, however long the shadow of its achievements, begins at their scale, which is exactly, exactly where the brilliance of Andrew Iden and Nate Powell shines. President Bill Clinton observed that their work, quote, brought a whole new generation with John Lewis, across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. I'm glad 
Andrew Iden grew up reading comics. Andrew is the creator and co-author of the March Trilogy. March is the first graphic novel to ever win the National Book Award. Congressman Lewis mentioned to Andrew the 1957 comic book, Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Story, and the role that it played, this comic, in the early days of the Civil Rights Movement. Recognizing the potential for a comic on Congressman Lewis's life to inspire young people, Andrew, who you will meet in a second, urged Congressman Lewis to write a comic about this time, his time in the movement. Congressman Lewis agreed, but had one condition, that Andrew write it with him. And in 2013, as a result, the March Trilogy was born. Andrew has won, to name a few, the National Book Award for Young People's Literature, the Siebert Medal, the Prince Award, and the Coretta Scott King Award. All this, while well, during his day job, he works with Congressman Lewis as his director, a digital director and policy advisor. Graphic novels, of course, require graphics. And that's where the brilliance of Nate Powell comes in. Nate began self-publishing at age 14. And since then, in addition to March, his work includes You Don't Say, Any Empire, Swallow Me Whole, The Silence of Our Friend, and The Year of the Beast. He is the first and only cartoonist to ever win the National Book Award. He has also won the RFK Book Award, two Ignitz Awards, two Harvey Awards, three Eisner Awards, and four Yalsa selections. Now, let us gather our minds around the life of Congressman John Lewis. Born the son of Alabama sharecroppers, Lewis's childhood was filled with deeply challenging and inspirational moments, including the Montgomery bus boycott and the words of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. heard on the radio. As a college student, he was chairman of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He was one of the big six leaders of groups that organized the 1963 March on Washington. Despite more than 40 arrests, physical attacks, and serious injuries, John Lewis remained and remains a devoted advocate of the philosophy of nonviolence. In 1981, he was elected to the Atlanta City Council, and in 1986, he was elected to Congress and has served as U.S. Representative of Georgia's 5th Congressional District since then. He has been awarded over 75 honorary degrees. He is a recipient of numerous awards from eminent national and international institutions, including the Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor granted by President Barack Obama. His dedication to the highest ethical standards and moral principles has won Lewis the admiration of colleagues on both sides of the aisle in the United States Congress. He has dedicated his life to protecting human rights, securing civil liberties, and building what he calls the beloved community in America. Congressman John Lewis's life and the March Trilogy reminds us that we are always becoming something as individuals, as a university, as a nation. Congressman Lewis's life and his work inspires us to become more, more just, more fair, more compassionate, more inclusive, more brave, more courageous. Please join me in welcoming Congressman John Lewis, Andrew Iden, and Nate Powell to the University of Michigan. Thank you so much. 
for those kind words of introduction. I must say that I'm delighted, very pleased and happy, really honored to be here. You're beautiful. <laughs> You're handsome. Just a good looking audience. Good to be here at this great university. I don't think I've been here since the 60s, but it's good to be back. Good to be back. Wonderful president, wonderful deans, wonderful faculty members, staff, and I know that you're the best students ever. <laughs> you're beyond that, okay. Well, I didn't grow up in a big city like Grand Rapids, Ann Arbor, Lansing, Detroit. You heard in the introduction, I grew up in rural Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery, outside of a little place called Troy. You, you, okay, that's okay. <laughs> you heard that my father was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But back in 1944, when I was four years old, now how many of you remember when you were four? What happened to the rest of us? <laughs> well, in 1944, when I was four years old, my father had saved $300. And a man sold him 110 acres of land. My family is still on this land today. Andrew and Nate would tell you that when I was a little child growing up on that farm, I would visit the little town of Troy, visit Montgomery, visit Tuskegee, visit Birmingham. And I would ask my mother and my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents about the signs that I saw. The signs that said white men, colored men, White women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. They would say, boy, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way. Don't get in trouble. But I was inspired to get in trouble. <laughs> Good trouble, necessary trouble. <laughs> Growing up on that farm sometime, I'd be out there working in the field, picking cotton pulling corn, gathering peanuts. And my mother would say, boy, you need to catch up. You're falling behind. And I would say, this is hard work. And she would say, hard work never kill anybody. I said, well, it's about to kill me. <laughs> now, if you go back for a little moment, Andrew and Nate would tell you that I'm probably jumping ahead here. But as a little child growing up, I fell in love with raising chickens. You know, you know anything about raising chickens? Oh, no, you don't know anything about raising chickens. <laughs> so I know you're smart. I know you're gifted. But you don't know anything about raising chickens. <laughs> when I was a little boy, I fell in love with raising chickens. If you read Marge book one, you know when you're sitting here, was set. I would take the fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, place them under the setting hen and wait for three long weeks for the little chicks to hatch. I know some of your smart students are saying, now John Lewis, why did you mark those fresh eggs with a pencil before you place them under the setting hen? Well, from time to time, another hen would get on that same nest and there would be some more fresh eggs. You had to be able to tell the fresh eggs for the eggs that were already under the setting hen. You follow me? Well, I was never quite able to save $18.98 to order the most inexpensive incubator from the Cicero Buck store. I know, young student, you don't know anything about the Cicero Buck store. <laughs> the Cicero Buck catalog. Some people call it the ordering book. Other people call it the wish book. I wish I had this, I wish I had that. So I just kept on wishing. But as a little child, about eight or nine years old, I've become very good at raising chickens. But I wanted to be a minister. So with the help of my brothers and sisters and cousins, 
We would gather all of our chickens together in the chicken yard, like you're gathered here in this beautiful, magnificent building. <laughs> and I would start preaching to the chickens. <laughs> and I would preach to the chickens. Some of the chickens would bow their heads. Some of the chickens would shake their heads. They never quite said amen. But I'm convinced that some of those chickens that I preached to in the 40s and the 50s tended to listen to me much better than some of my colleagues listened to me today in the Congress. <laughs> now, I understand one of my colleagues is here tonight. Debbie Dinger is here. Debbie, Debbie Dinger is one of the best. She always listens and always doing the right thing. Thank you, Debbie, for being here. As a matter of fact, some of those chickens that I raised was a little more productive. At least they produce eggs. <laughs> Debbie will tell you about the Congress later. Well, when we growing up as a young child in 1955, 15 years old in the 10th grade, I heard about Rosa Parks. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on our radio. The action of Rosa Parks and the words of Dr. King inspired me to find a way to get in the way. And I got in the way. I got in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. So when I was very, very young, I wrote a letter to Dr. King. He wrote me back. He sent me a round trip Greyhound bus ticket. Invited me to come to Montgomery to meet with him. I applied to enter a little school called Troy State College, now known as Troy University. It didn't admit black students. So I was accepted at a little college in Nashville, Tennessee, known now as American Baptist College. Submitted my application, my high school transcript, and went off to school. An uncle of mine gave me a $100 bill, more money than I ever had. Gave me a footlocker. I put everything that I own in that footlocker, except those chickens, <laughs> and took a Greyhound bus to Nashville. And after being there for about two weeks, I told one of my teachers that I'd been in contact with Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., he informed Dr. King that I was there. His teacher studied with Dr. King at Morehouse College in Atlanta. So in March of 1958, when I was home for spring break, I boarded a bus. I traveled to 50 miles from Troy to Montgomery. And a young lawyer by the name of Fred Gray, who had been a lawyer for Rosa Parks, for Dr. King, and the Montgomery Movement, met me at the Greyhound bus station and drove me to the First Baptist Church, pastor by the Reverend Rath Abernathy, a colleague of Dr. King, and ushered me into the office of the church. I saw Martin Luther King Jr. and Rath Abernathy standing behind the desk. And Dr. King said to me, are you the boy from Troy? Are you John Lewis? I said, Dr. King, I am John Robert Lewis. I gave my whole name. I wanted him to be sure that I was the right person. <laughs> and we had a wonderful discussion about the possibility of me going to Troy State. I went back and had a discussion with my mother and my father and told them what Dr. King had said, that we may have to sue the state of Alabama Troy State University, a home could be bombed or burned. We could lose the land. So they were so afraid, I continued to study in Nashville. March, book one, will tell you, that during those days in Nashville, many of us started attending nonviolent workshop. We studied the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. We started the whole idea of building the beloved community, making Nashville an open city. Black and white high school students and college students would come together every Tuesday night 
at 6.30 p.m. near Fish University, had role playing, social drama. And then we started sitting in. We had test sit-ins in the fall and winter of 1959. And after the sit-in started in Greensburg, North Carolina, in February 1960, we started sitting down. Be sitting down in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion, waiting to be served, and someone would come up and spit on us. We put a light cigarette out in our hair, or down our backs, pour hot water, hot coffee, hot chocolate on us, beat us. And one day we were told if we continue to sit in, we would get arrested. We would go to jail. Never been arrested, never going to jail. I wanted to look what students back then called fresh. You heard that? I wanted to look fresh. I wanted to look clean. I wanted to look sharp. I had very little money. So I went to a used men's store in downtown Nashville and bought a suit, a used suit. And on February 27th, 1960, 80 nine of us were arrested, black and white college students from Fish University, Vanderbilt University, Tennessee State University, Fisk, Mahara Medical College, American Baptist College. The moment I was arrested and taken to jail, I felt free. I felt liberated. I felt like I crossed over. So during the 60s, I was arrested 40 times, and since I've been in Congress, another five times, and I'm probably going to get arrested again for something. <laughs> my philosophy, March is saying, and my philosophy is saying that when you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have a moral obligation to stand up and say something do something, speak up, speak out. In this day and age, we need to be brave, courageous, and bold. There are forces, there are forces in America today that's trying to take us back. We come too far, we made too much progress, and we're not going back. We're going forward. <laughs> when we were planning the march on Washington for August 28, 1963, there was a man by the name of A. Philip Randolph, who was the dean of black leadership. This man was born in Jacksonville, Florida, moved to New York City, became a champion of civil rights, human rights, and labor rights. He was said to all of us from time to time, maybe our foremothers and our forefathers all came to this great land in different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. That is still true today. So it doesn't matter whether we're black or white, Latino, Asian American, or Native American. Doesn't matter whether we're straight or gay. We are one people. We are one family. We all live in the same house, not just the American house, but the world house. <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. put it another way, and I'm honored to be here, to be standing in a place where he stood in 1962. But Dr. King would say over and over again, we must learn to live together as brothers and sisters. If not, we are perish as fools. This university have a rich history. You represent the best. You, the students, the young people, must be the leaders of the 21st century. You must get us there. You must help save, not just America, but help save the planet. Yeah. 
I said to students from time to time and to some of my colleagues, we have a right to know what is in the food we eat. We have a right to know what is in the water we drink. We have a right to know what is in the air we breathe. This little piece of real estate we call Earth is not our to waste. But to leave it a little cleaner, a little more peaceful for generation yet unborn. That is our calling. If we fail to do it, who would do it? During the 60s, we hadn't heard of the internet. Facebook, what is that? <laughs> Andrew know a great deal about the use of social media. Use it well. But I tell you, if it hadn't been for Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks and hundreds and thousands of others, I don't know what, where we would be. But out of this community, out of the state of Michigan, out of this city, out of this university, many young people emerge. Just think, in 1961, the same year that President Barack Obama was born, black people and white people in 1961 could be seated together on a Greyhound bus or trailway bus, leaving Washington, D.C. to travel through the South. We were arrested, we were jailed and beaten. More than 400 of us, including college professors, college students, ministers, priests, rabbis, lawyers and doctors, just trying to bring down those signs. Those signs are gone. There may be some invisible signs, but those signs are gone, and the only place that you'll see those signs today would be in a book, in a museum, or on a video. They are gone, and they will not return. I said to you as students and young people, whatever you do, whatever you say, do it in a peaceful, orderly, nonviolent fashion. Never hate, for hate is too heavy a burden to bear. The way of love, the way of peace is much better. Let me give you one example. On the Freedom Rides in 1961, my seatmate was a young white gentleman from Connecticut. We left Washington, D.C., arrived in a little town called Rock Hill, South Carolina. We were beaten and left lying in a pool of blood. This is May 1961. In February of 09, one of the people who beat us came to my Capitol Hill office in Washington. He was in his 70s with his son in his 40s. He said, Mr. Lewis, I've been a member of the Klan. I beat you, but I come today to say, forgive me. His son started crying. He started crying. I said, I forgive you. I accept your apology. They hugged me. I hugged them back. And I cried. It's the power of the way of peace, the way of love, the power of the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. Is it possible for students and scholars to come together and teach us the way of love, the way of peace? Can we move to a different level and create the beloved community? Can we redeem the soul of America? Can we get it right here in America? Maybe we can be a model for the rest of the world. Is that possible? Yeah. Let's try. Let's do it. Let's do it.
Can we do it? Yes. I want to close by saying never, ever give up. Never, ever lose that sense of hope. Never lose faith. We will redeem the soul of America. We will create the beloved community. Create a community at peace with itself. I'm honored to be here tonight with Andrew Iden and Nate Powell. These two young men was like brothers. So it's all up to you two now. Thank you. Thank you very much. How do you follow that? <laughs> uh, my name is Andrew Iden, and uh, I serve as digital director and policy advisor to the congressman, and uh, I'm the co-author of March. Basically, this is all my fault. <laughs> when I say digital director, that, that means I tweet for a living. <laughs> you guys laugh, but that, that's a big deal these days. Huge. <laughs> Little bit about me, I, uh, I was raised by a single mom. If you ever have the opportunity to see a single mother, thank her for all that she's doing. If you were raised by a th single mother, Thank her a lot. I'm also the child of a Muslim immigrant. My father was a Muslim immigrant, which is great. Yeah, there, there's a lot of perks that come with being the uh, child of a Muslim immigrant. <laughs> TSA gives you all sorts of special attention. The president is always talking about you. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, honestly, there's not very many of us on Capitol Hill. In fact, that's actually why I grew my beard out is because, um, yeah, yeah, woo with a beard. Um, I, was, I was really frustrated. I, I didn't, I sort of, it, it, it was a thing that I kept quiet, right? The only time you really knew is when you couldn't pronounce my last name. And... All of us have something that is unique about ourselves. And for some of us, it also carries a burden. And it is all too easy for us to be quiet. But when you stand on stage with John Lewis, you can't be quiet about those things. You have to speak up about them. And so, I tell you all the great things about being the child of a Muslim immigrant. And I tell you what it is to work for John Lewis. So how do we get here? It all started in 2008. It was the summer of hope and change. Barack Obama was sweeping through the Democratic primaries and I was serving as the Congressman's press secretary. I was newly promoted. I had been answering his mail, <laughs> which made me immensely qualified. Um, it's actually, uh, when my mom asked me what I did, I, I told her I uh, answer a lot of Dear John letters. True story. <laughs> and so it was coming down to the end of that campaign and folks started talking about what they were going to do after. Some folks said they were going to go to the beach. Some said they were going to go see their parents. And I said I was going to a comic book convention. 
which was really cool <laughs> to me. But to everybody else, they laughed at me. Except for one person. I heard a deep voice say, don't laugh. There was a comic book during the movement, and it was very influential. And it was John Lewis standing up for me as he stood up for so many of us. The comic book was called Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Story. It's the first time I'd ever heard of it. So I went home that night after work and I looked it up on the internet. And it was amazing to me. It was this beautiful 50s studio style comic. It, it talked about Martin Luther King. It talked about Gandhi. It, it was, a, it was a, the best introduction to nonviolence I'd ever seen in 16 pages. Now, I had spent that summer hearing stories I'd never heard before. I grew up in the congressman's district. He's been my congressman since I was three years old, in fact. And yet, after growing up in his district, after going to Atlanta public schools and ultimately a private school, nobody had ever told me the story of SNCC. Not until that summer. Not until I heard John Lewis say it himself. And I, and I watched as young people's eyes lit up when they heard it because it's not just a story about what happened, it's a story of power. It's a story about how young people can stand up against injustice, but more importantly, how young people have more power in our society than we ever give them credit for. And so I sat there looking at a comic book and I thought, you know, there should be a John Lewis comic book. Yeah. <laughs> so I went to work the next day. And, you know, everybody's talking about how do we reach young people. By this point, I had convinced them to join Facebook. <laughs> this other thing that they dubbed the tweeter was coming. But we were, we were on it, right? And everybody wanted to know. I mean, Barack Obama reached more young people than any presidential candidate in a generation. And, and everybody else wanted to know how or how they could do it better. And there was also this lingering question, this question of why do young people not know about the civil rights movement? There's actually a term for it. It's called the nine word problem. It's a term coined by the Southern Poverty Law Center. In a sense, most students graduate from high school only knowing nine words about the civil rights movement. Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, I have a dream. And that's it, right? So we're having this conversation and they say, well, you know, how does John Lewis reach young people? And I raise my hand. And I said, John Lewis should write a comic book. And he was so sweet about it. The congressman, <laughs> he kind of looked at me, everybody else is shaking their head. And the congressman said, oh, well, uh, uh, maybe, yeah. If you know me, you know that I, I, if I have an idea and I get my teeth in it, I, I don't let go. And so I kept asking, and I asked just about every day for the rest of that campaign. Until the congressman finally turned to me and he said, okay, I'll do it. But only if you write it with me. And that moment changed my life. So how do you get from there to here? Because if you do the dates, it was five years from that idea to book one coming out. There, there, there was no literary agent. There was no contract waiting for us. I had to come up with the title. I had to put together the pitch. I was going around to publishers all over New York. Everybody in Congress thought I was crazy. I got more no's than Mitch McConnell. <laughs> that was nonviolent. All right. And finally, you know, I, bless his heart, the congressman went to a comic book convention with me. <laughs> and, I mean, this is not what you expect, right? Like, it's Dragon Con, which also is the freaky of the comic book conventions. <laughs> and um, he comes in to have lunch, and he's looking around all these people in costumes. He's like, 
So this is what you do? <laughs> that congressman is great. These people love each other. And I kept telling him, you know, the one thing that I love so much about comics is that it is an entire collection of people who share a love of reading. And that, that is who I am. That is who I was raised to be. My, uh, my mother would take me to libraries a lot as a kid. We didn't have a lot of money, but the library was free, right? And if you've ever heard the Congressman's National Book Award speech, remember, he wasn't let in a library, and I was. And that's why I get to stand here at 34 and talk to you about my book, all right? So he came. He came to this comic book convention. And, and actually, it was really funny because a comic book creator that I have been knowing since I was like a little kid, like 12, he uh, comes up to the congressman and he goes, oh my God, you're a real celebrity. <laughs> and I'm sitting there watching my childhood meet my adulthood. <laughs> and, and, you know, he's like, will you take a picture of the two of us? I'm like, sure, this is super weird. Anyway, he said, so if you need anything, give me a call not thinking I would ever call him, <laughs> but I did. And so I called up the front desk at Marvel Comics. And I said, I'm looking for Jimmy Palmiotti. They said, oh, where are you calling from? I said, the United States Congress. Pause. <laughs> I don't know if you know, but there were some hearings in the mid 50s that didn't go so well for the comic book industry. <laughs> and they got really nervous. But Jimmy called me back. And he said, you know, this is publisher, it's called Top Shelf, I, I think you should call him. Turns out they were just up the road from, from Atlanta, and so I did. And the guy made me write the whole first book on spec, but he published it. And we found Nate, and we came together, and it was an experience. Well, I'll pause and I'll say this. I'd never written a book before. I'd never written a comic book before. I'd written some radio scripts, some tweets, some ads. <laughs> this was a different beast. But if you're ever afraid of doing something for the first time, the best advice I can give you is go and see who did it well and do your best to do it like they did. So I went and read Mouse, Persepolis, Fun Home, you know, the usual suspects. And this is great risk because the whole time the congressman is taking grief from everybody on Capitol Hill, why are you doing this comic book silliness? And I'm writing my graduate thesis at the same time, right? Because, you know, I, I wanted a challenge. I, I wanted to go to grad school at night and write comics and work in Congress. But I was writing my graduate thesis on Martin Luther King and the Montgomery story. I wanted to know its history. And one of the things that I found was that Martin Luther King Jr. himself actually helped edit it. Kind of blows your mind, right? Martin Luther King Jr., comic book editor. <laughs> but it showed me that we were on the path that had been walked before. He had used these comic books to inspire some of the earliest acts of civil disobedience of the movement. And that's what we were trying to do. We weren't just making these comic books so that we could tell John Lewis's story. We were making them because we believed there needed to be a new nonviolent revolution in this country. We didn't know if it was going to work. We didn't know if it was going to work until just before book one came out. And I got a phone call from a reporter at a conservative newspaper that shall remain nameless. Mm hmm <laughs> And he said, look, man, I got a copy of your book. And I loved it. I, re I read it. And uh, I don't usually do this, but I gave it to my nine-year-old son. And I wanted you to know that, that he read it. And um, now he's gone, he's put on his Sunday suit, and he's marching around my house demanding equality for everyone. <laughs> Imagine if we instilled a social consciousness in every nine-year-old in America. <laughs> and, and let's not stop there. 
I think there's some other folks that need a social consciousness too. And so that's what we're doing. I mentioned earlier that I tweet for a living. And what I want to ask you is, when you think about these social media tools, think about what would Dr. King tweet? What would Gandhi post? How would they use these tools? We're, we're seeing them used for unbelievable evil, misinformation, but we're also seeing the potential for them to be used for good. You have the capacity to organize on a scale that the world has never seen before. Social media wasn't meant to be a news outlet. It was meant to be a way for us all to connect with each other. And there is no more important function of our connection than organizing for the betterment of our society. And so what we tried to do in March is to lay out the fundamental principles. And it was not easy. John Lewis obviously had a day job. We would work at night. I would, I would record his voice. I was constantly asking him questions. And he would stay up and, and sometimes on the other end of the line, you, you just hear this little snore. <laughs> you don't snore, sir, I'm sorry. <laughs> but sometimes it would be me too, in all fairness. But we spent months and years taking down the congressman's words, looking through primary resources, primary sources, which are more important now than you realize. For, for the students of the movement in the room, I, I strongly encourage you to visit crmvet.org. It is the single best repository of primary documents from the civil rights movement I have ever found. It surpasses any academic collection I have ever seen. And it's all free. And that's what we used. If you know the scene at the end of, or at the beginning of book three, where they map out the Freedom Summer and there's a whole dialogue. Nate calls it the Council of Elrond. Because <laughs> he talks, it's a lot of talking. And you may ask yourself, did we dramatize that? But we didn't. We took meeting minutes because we were able to find them. And we used that to create the narrative. And there is so much more out there. We just scratched the surface. How many of your stories should be told that way? But more importantly, how many can you find that need to be elevated? I believe comics have that power because your generation, you are digital natives. You grew up on the internet, which means that you speak in words and pictures. And so if we are going to teach you the fundamental lessons of the civil rights movement, we have to do it in your language. So let's assume that that all happened, that you guys understand the principles and you are ready to organize. And there's so much going on in this world that we need to address. Where do I think you need to start? What is the one issue that if we address first, not necessarily that it is the worst atrocity going on in our society, but that will open up more doors for everyone. It is student loans. <laughs> Took me three bestsellers to pay off mine. You shouldn't have to do that. That is too hard. But more importantly, where would we have been if the young people of the civil rights movement had had student loans. If John Lewis had had to go to work instead of take the chairmanship of SNCC after he graduated, there would be no Civil Rights Act. There would be no Voting Rights Act. Let me put it to you another way. When John Lewis got married in 1969, 68, 68, <laughs> the wedding announcement read, Lillian Miles to wed unemployed political activist John Lewis. <laughs> People who are ahead of their time pay a price. And we must lift the burden of debt so that another generation is free to pay that price for us. Yes, sir. 
All right, I'm going to tell you one more story. When I was in high school, I uh, was in my English class. And I would bring my comic books with me. And I got caught one day with them out on my desk. And my English teacher came by. She said, I'm sorry, you can't have those out right now. Those aren't real books. No, no. Well, I got to go back to my high school. <laughs> and I got to have a wonderful conversation with that very same teacher <laughs> about her experiences teaching March in her classroom. I don't offer that story as a form of comeuppance to the teacher. She's doing the Lord's work. And, and frankly, she was expressing the prevailing wisdom of the time. But I offer it as an example of the power of an idea whose time has come and the brief period in which change is possible. So I ask all of you, join us. March. Everybody, how's it going? I'm the third guy. <laughs> now, just to put you at ease, if I don't get a standing ovation, it's okay. I'll save my tears for backstage. It's cool. It's fine. Um, I'm also the least polished, and thus the dude with the notes. That's fine. But actually, these are these are new ideas that I've consolidated into words in the last couple months. So it's time for new ideas to come to light. Okay, see so y'all. First off, thank you for being here and thanks for having us. Uh, I, I spent some time living in Michigan back in 2001 and 2002. Uh, I've played a lot, of, a lot of music and played a lot of shows throughout the state over the years. And Michigan remains one of my favorite states and holds a very special place in my heart. So really glad to be here. So I was born in 78. And I'm from Arkansas, and right on. Uh, I spent a lot of my elementary school years in Montgomery, Alabama. Yes. And, uh, and my parents are baby boomers from northern Mississippi. So growing up in the, like the mid-1980s, I did grow up with a very basic working knowledge of just key moments and figures in the civil rights movement, and very basic but it served its function. Most of this was through my parents, whether it was historical information or personal anecdotes that helped complete the picture of their lives as people growing up in and through what is recognized as the end of the Jim Crow South. Hearing these stories in Montgomery, Alabama, um, most of them were, were often punctuated at the time with like this caveat, this exception where they'd be like, oh, but that was a different time. This is not that. You know, these are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> and, like, I didn't have the vocabulary for it at the time, but it was hard to reconcile that exception they were offering to each of these stories because sometimes the, the historical information that I was, that I was receiving or even what I, what I was learning through uh, photography and video throughout the movement was depicting events that were happening like three miles down the, house, down the street from my house in downtown Montgomery, locations I had visited, places with which I was familiar uh, throughout the Deep South. And yet the documentation of those events really stuff that's happening just 10 to 15 years before I was born. 
And looking back at age 39, like you can touch 10 years, that's nothing. But it was, it was really, it had this layer of unreality to it. Uh, and this, this sort of exception they would offer that it was a different time uh, was sort of sabotaging their own intention by giving it this abstract quality. And it sort of removed the sense of continuity that these were the struggles and experiences of people who could have been or were my neighbors, who could have been a part of my family, and in a different world could have been me. And likewise, the perpetrators of that injustice could have been and possibly were my neighbors, members of my family, could have been me. And so growing up, I would reconcile that with, often Congressman Lewis will say, if you want to come up to me and you want to tell me how things haven't changed, I'll say, come walk in my shoes and I will show you change. And I take that to heart and I line it up with that little exception my parents would give. And as we, were, as we moved into our work on March, it sort of became my personal mission to destroy that layer of abstraction from that grainy black and white photography and black and white video, uh, to destroy those, that layer of unreality and, sort of, and underline a sense of continuity. Not only that, this, that we were occupying the same world as the documentation with which we have become quite familiar, but also that the struggle itself, that the movement itself is an ongoing struggle, an intergenerational struggle, a struggle of many lifetimes. And I'm proud to be a part of conveying that. So I've been publishing comics for 25 years, and the, you know, the, the crappy self-published comics I did as a teenager, I don't, I don't, in a lot of ways I consider that to be the same work that I'm doing now, filtered through a different lens and everything. I'm really proud for March to be a part of helping squash the debate within our country about legitimacy of comics as an art form, as a means of storytelling, as a, as a legitimate form of literature. It's awesome to be a part of that. But at the same time, I want to stick up for the superhero comics, which shaped me. Like, <laughs> we comics people have spent a lot of time, I think, rightly so, I guess, to legitimize our, our art form, you know, being like, you know, there are always newspaper articles and magazine articles, they're like, whoa, zap, bang, pow, comics aren't just for kids anymore. Uh, but really, Chris Claremont's run on the X-Men in the 1980s is basically the thing that activated my social conscience in full. And perceiving, you know, getting to perceive the world which we share through the lens of a fantasy world, through a cast of characters, getting to recognize different dimensions of racism, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, nationalism through these mutant adventures was profoundly affecting. So, you know, if this is like your first graphic novel or if this is your intro to comics, welcome. But, you know, spend some time here. It, comics have changed my life time and time again throughout my entire life. So please, read some comics, y'all. Go to the library, it's free. And moving ahead into our collaboration on March, I think, relatively speaking, until very recently, I shared an assumption with many people that the gains of the civil rights movement, the, the social, the civic, the legislative gains were universally accepted and acknowledged, so much so that their existence and those victories themselves are taken for granted. And in real time, I think throughout, throughout the trilogy, but also throughout my adult life, you know, I've watched whether it's conventional wisdom and public opinion, or whether it's specific individuals with some kind of vested self-interest or agenda rush to line up on the right side of history after the fact, but only after simplifying and revising the history of the movement so much as to defang it. And another... that became another guiding principle within March was 
how to show the internal conflicts, intergenerational conflicts, how to show shifts in philosophy, strategy, tactics, how to show that revolution and that progress, that social change is messy, it's inconvenient, and it's also necessary. All of these things are true. And there are so many causes to fight for and against each day, every day. It is overwhelming, it's disheartening. Uh, it fills you with anxiety and doom and dread. And over time, I don't know, a lot of it comes to learning once again to trust that there are millions of other people like you who feel the same way about those causes. Learning to rely on your ability to pick those causes which you are passionate about and pursue them and put a little more energy into them and trust that there's another you out there and there are millions of other little yous out there with parallel concerns and trust other people to follow those causes as well. And in selecting those battles and selecting those causes, I've kind of found myself full circle with Andrew and with Congressman Lewis's guiding principle in 2008, 2009 at the genesis of March, when Andrew was talking about being a staffer and hearing all these stories of the movement, questions going around throughout the campaign, in the office, amidst your circle. How do we activate young people? How do we represent the history of the movement? How do we revitalize it for a new generation and for a new world? Throughout these last five years of work, I really have circled around to the imperative of civil rights education. Uh, and it is difficult to pick causes in which to invest that much time and energy. But there's an urgency to providing truthful, historical, contextualized accounts of American struggles for equality and representation. And yes, all students need a good civil rights education. And we must continue these active efforts to show the movement in context with struggles for women's rights, for workers' rights, for LGBTQ rights, and so on. Now, on its face, that concept seems like such a no-brainer that many folks, even a majority, and we are all guilty to a degree, will discount it with the assumption that just providing that history itself isn't a present day problem. But here's the thing. The Southern Poverty Law Center has given 20 states an F on their civil rights education, and several of those actually require none whatsoever. And even growing up in the South, when we were discussing the nine word problem, in which most kids graduate from high school knowing Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, I have a dream, I graduated from high school in Arkansas, and we never even got to civil rights in eighth grade or 11th grade American history because we ran out of time. <laughs> I know how it is. And it's not just a matter of the history itself. It's not just about letting people of all kinds see heroes who look like them. It is about seeing connections between seemingly different struggles and seeing actual equality as being in everyone's interest. That shouldn't be a controversial statement, but it's a very dangerous idea to those in power. Now, when we do provide that rich history, we disrupt the dominant narrative of leaders and figureheads passing change down from the mountaintop. That was one of our guiding principles and one of our missions throughout March. When we do tell that rich history, that complicated, that messy history, what is told is thousands of people's millions of hours of thankless, frustrating, risky, unsexy work. People with differing philosophies and ideals finding a way to meet their common objectives. What is told is young people risking their lives to put their ideals into action to shape the fabric of our society further than their elders had, oftentimes. And what is told is the crucial role played by dedicated journalists acting on behalf of a free press 
and the public's relationship to that media itself as history unfolds. And that is something I really took for granted before March. That was a real wake-up call for me, uh, going through the research and then getting to the drawing table and then seeing the script with new eyes, reevaluating the research and understanding just how explicit the, the strategy of contacting and developing a relationship with the media before, during, and after actions to say, we will be here at this time, at this place, for this reason. This is our expected outcome. Here is our contact, and then following through. What is told is comfortable white people driven by either their conscience or by social pressure or some combination of the two to admit to fundamental injustices, to their role within it, and ultimately participating on some level in rectifying them. That's not going to happen by itself. What is told is a disciplined movement balancing its philosophy of organized, dedicated nonviolence with the reality of rural black Southerners' lives, which often required an armed self-defense stance to protect their families from white supremacist terror. And I think this is one of the messiest and most inconvenient truths of the history of the movement, but it is essential to understand the situation on the ground throughout America. And most important, what is told is that inequality is not something that's fixed once. It requires constant vigilance. And the arc of the moral universe only bends toward justice when we bend it. So to wrap this up and to take it back to the beginning of my involvement with March, I think right off the bat, what was so affecting to me was just even a, in my first read of Walking with the Wind, I immediately, within 20 pages, identified so strongly with John Lewis as a six-year-old on a farm in central Alabama. Specifically, the gravity and the intensity with which he viewed the world around him. And his ability to recognize injustice on a small scale, and then that expanding as his worldview expanded. I felt precisely the same way as a six-year-old, and I think most people do. And I think a lot of our world and a lot of the systems which control us work very hard at kind of whittling away at those edges, whittling away at that sensitivity to injustice and, and the ways in which we perceive it all around us. Now, I have, I have two daughters. My oldest one is about to turn six. And it's wild. You know, by the time a kid is four, I've been able to see that that's when my daughter started requesting reading book one as part of her bedtime read, right when she turned four. And uh, I've, over each read, I've been able to get more concrete and more specific as her worldview expands to meet the world around her. But very, like, even at age four, kids have a very clear-cut understanding of fairness and of injustice. They've encountered bullies in their life, and soon after that they understand and have experienced or witnessed injustice based on difference. These function on a very basic, simple level in addition to a very complex, you know, adult level uh, that we experience, but it is the same issue. And ultimately, I think what's, what's most important is to take that forward and take that identification with a young John Lewis and his teenage peers, his young adult peers, and be able to say, look, this is what a dedicated, thoughtful, committed group of young people were able to do at age 20. And not even at age 20 they could do this, but as Andrew was pointing out, especially because they were 20. And so it's, you know, it forces me to look back and be like, well, what was I doing when I was 20? Or what did I think I was doing? And for those of us who are not yet 20, it poses a challenge and a question. What will you do when you are 20? 
And the good news is, you get to decide that, and only you get to decide that. But this is not a drill, and it never was. And thanks, y'all. I got this thing. Guys, we're going to take some questions. Yes, yeah, so the folks. But they are pre selected. Yes. Yes. So our first question is right here. Hi, my name is Madison Chasen. I'm a junior at the University of Michigan in the College of Allison A. My question is for the congressman, but could also be posed to all three of you with reference to your own life experiences. Congressman, you've experienced things beyond what most of us could even imagine and have accomplished so much as both an activist and a political leader. Looking back on the things that you've done and the choices that you've made, do you have any regrets? Would you change anything and why? Well, I first met Dr. King in 1958 when I was 18 years old. First heard of him in 1955 when I was 15. I wish somehow when I look back that I had spent more time with him. Uh, he inspired me. If it hadn't been for Martin Luther King Jr., I don't know who I would be. Thank you. Um, he taught us the way of peace, the way of love, taught us the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. But uh, we thought he would be around for a long time. He was so young and he was taken from us. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so um, Congressman Lewis, I would like to personally thank you um, on behalf of me and my peers. And um, basically, we like to say thank you for devoting your life to helping others through the work that you've done politically and socially and um, through your words as a speaker and uh, now through the book series, The March. We are the next generation. We are juniors in high school and we will still soon be stepping into the adult world. What you have fought against and dealt with has kind of popped its head back back up around what we do. So how do, how do I and my generation, how do we prepare ourselves to fight against what you fought against? Well, I would say to you, to members of your generation, learn as much as you can. When I was in school, I had a teacher who said to me over and over again, read my child, read. We had very few books in our home because we grew up very, very poor. Uh, we didn't have a subscription to the local newspaper, but my grandfather had one. And when he would finish reading his newspaper each day, he would pass it on to us. So I kept up with current events. Keep up. And when you see a need to say something, to do something, speak up. Speak out. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you all for coming. We all really appreciate you guys being here and speaking to us. Um, secondly, my question for you, Congressman John Lewis, is what are some similarities and differences you see between young civil rights activists versus the activists you see in my generation? And what is some advice you can give to these activists who want to follow in your footsteps? It's a very good <laughs> statement, very good question. Um, <laughs> be at home with yourself. Be at home with yourself. Sometime maybe you should have what I call an executive session with yourself. Just don't talk <laughs> back to yourself. 
<laughs> Maybe you can just say, you know, this is the path I'm going to take. This is what I'm going to do. But I'm going to be open, candid, and honest. Get, get involved in American politics. Mm -hmm. One day, one of you, maybe, just maybe, could be governor of a state, a member of Congress, a president of the United States of America. A wonderful teacher, wonderful lawyer, wonderful a doctor. So never ever give up on yourself. We all have the potential to become better. Thank you. Uh, hello, I just want to first say thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. I know, um, like she said, we all sincerely appreciate it. Um, my name is Christopher Platty, and I'm a freshman here at uh, University of Michigan. And my question to you, John Lewis, is um, in the next 20 to 30 years, um, what would you personally like to see change in the United States in regard to um, equality and also the discrimination still felt today by many minorities and, and from a more general perspective, uh, the world? Well, in the next 20, 30 years, I don't know why I'd be, but I tell you, I would, I would like to see a free America, a better America, a better world that we have to lay down the tools and instrument of violence. It's not in the room for violence. We spend hundreds, thousands, millions, and billions of dollars on guns, on missiles, on bombs. We need to teach people the way of peace, yep. the way of love, the philosophy of love. Thank you. Thank you. My name is my name is Xue Rui Ling, and uh, I'm a junior here at the University of Michigan. My question for Congressman Lewis is: um, Racism in this country in the last century were known around the world to be very militant and aggressive. Why was growing up in China, uh, the high school history classes I had on the civil rights movement spent half of its paragraphs to talk about? all the violence, lynching, and the racial riots that happened in the 50s and 60s. So, uh, Congressman, when you joined the civil rights movement, why did you choose to confront violence in a nonviolent way, and how did you keep facing your choice? Thank you. We, we, we studied the life and teaching of Gandhi, passive resistance. We wanted to create a society at peace with itself. We wanted to create what we call the beloved community and lay down the burden of hate to bring people together that was embedded in us. So when I was beaten and left bloody on the bridge in Selma, I thought I saw death. I thought I was going to die. But I knew by being beaten, and other people being beaten, 17 of us are hospitalized, that somehow, in some way, we wanted to open up the political process, make it possible for everybody to become participants in the democratic process. There were black lawyers and doctors and teachers, college professors, college presidents, who were told they could not read or write well enough. They failed the so-called literacy test. People were asked to count the number of bubbles on a bar soap the number of jelly beans in a jar. So we had to change that. Andrew, you want to add something? Nate, you want to add something? We can add this in retrospect, but uh, there's actually been a fair amount of academic study about how racially oppressed minorities can stand up. And the evidence is overwhelmingly that nonviolence is the only solution. I remember I, I said this one time and somebody came back to me and said, but the American Revolution, and I was like, yeah, white people. <laughs> and, and what we're talking about is, is fundamentally different, right? Because racial oppression has a certain edge to it that requires almost a holier-than-thou approach because it is... <laughs> There's too many guns in this, <laughs> in this country to begin with. But 
fundamentally, the, the data backs it up if you're looking at it from this day and age. Um, and it isn't overwhelming. I mean, you're still up against really tough odds. Well, the statistic with, that you've brought to light for me, it, it's important to recognize that you know, successful struggles are still uphill struggles. What the statistic that you've thrown around is basically that nonviolence works about a third of the time. It's important to not lose sight of that. that that's what requires the months, the years, the generations of, of work to actually get those incremental gains and maintain them. Right. One out of three over the long run gets you where you're going. And that's, I know that that's not encouraging in some ways, but if that's the statistical truth, it's important to bring that to light. Thank you. Thank you all for your answers. Hello, I want to thank you all for just coming and spending the time to talk with us tonight. Um, I'm, my name is Ebony Perus Harvey, and I am representing the March Book Club at the School of Education, and some of my colleagues are over there. Just want to give them a shout. Um, and so we've had discussions about March, and I'm really interested in how you guys feel about this. So we were talking about the fact that we have so many talented people across the nation, including on our very own campus, that are activist leaders. Um, but it seems that sometimes our leadership across the nation is not necessarily in dialogue with one another. And in your graphic novels, there's strategic coordination of activism across the federal, state, and community levels, as well as activist organizations. So our question is, how do we create a system of strategic coordination across these different levels where activism is occurring, but seemingly uncoordinated? Well, it, it, it should be, it's, during the day and age of social media, it should be easier. Mm -hmm. Really, it really should be, mm -hmm. you know? When I was growing up, we didn't, we had, you know anything about party line on the telephone? <laughs> Can you just teach a sister right now? You, just you, teach me. Party line. <laughs> and, and several people on the same line. Mm -hmm. Several family. Yeah. And you, have to, you could eavesdrop sometimes. <laughs> or you had to wait till someone gave up their line. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, everybody, everybody, even little kids are talking on the telephone. Mm -hmm. we, sh we should be able to do a much better job in organizing and bringing people together. The Women March, in my estimation, was one of the most, one of the most amazing and unbelievable coming together in such a short time. Mm -hmm. That's why I truly believe years to come, and next year in particular, will be the year of the woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look, too many young people, too many of us, too many young people fail to get out and participate in the democratic process. Yeah. We got to vote mm -hmm. like we never voted before. Yes. Three young men that I knew, Andy Goodman, Micah Scherner, and James Shaney, mm -hmm. working in Mississippi in June of 1964. These three young men went out to investigate the burning of an African-American church to be used for voter registration workshop. They were stopped by the sheriff, taken to jail, released from jail, turned over to the Klan, where they were beaten, shot, and killed. Mm -hmm. And I tell young people all the time, these three young men didn't die in Vietnam, but in the Middle East, or Eastern Europe, or in Africa, or Central South America. They died right here in our own country. Yep. That's why we got to vote like we never voted before, all of us. Yeah. Part of the reason we spent so much time in the books explaining the ways in which SNCC was organized, the ways in which records were kept, the ways in which um, they interacted with each other. The you know how we always refer to like, well, then we had an executive committee meeting, right? Mm -hmm. And we're showing you point by point how they formed the organization. Um, the, the leaderless movement isn't going to function 
you need spokespeople, you need organization. It doesn't necessarily have to be a cult of personality, but ask yourselves, today we have the NAACP still, we have the Urban League, we have these same organizations that were around during the movement, yeah. but we don't have SNCC. And so what we've been trying to do is to inspire the young people to indigenously form yeah. their own SNCC for this generation. Yeah. And to a certain extent, it is happening, mm -hmm. but it's changing just like the technology, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, now we have the hashtag Black Lives Matter. And thankfully, the courts proved to us that you can't sue a hashtag. <laughs> and so it's changing, it's yeah. developing. It doesn't mean we've reached the final form of this, um, but I think our role, all of us, particularly educators and those of us who are telling the stories, is to instill the fundamental principles and to be that subtle nudge and encouragement, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, someone's still got to fill the role of Ella Baker or Jim Lawson and shepherd these young people into forming that organization. Yeah. Thank you. Well, also, on, on that note, yeah, I think uh, often it, it's very easy for all of us, I think, as Americans to be stuck in a mode of thinking about top-down hierarchical power structures. Mm -hmm. And it, it's amazing to to learn about the tale of SNCC, an intentionally decentralized, non-hierarchical non -hierarchical structure <laughs> that at a certain point of energy and mass density recognized that to establish itself and to further its goals, yeah, specific responsibilities were delegated, roles had to be played and maintained, even in a, a vaguely non-hierarchical structure. And for me, as a part of my generation, coming from uh, like activism through punk and more of like a socialist anarchist perspective, younger in life, and being well acquainted with, the, with different kinds of non-hierarchical models, still to organize and to mobilize, yeah. it involves that same principle of recognizing that people have a job to do, and that doesn't necessarily make it a top-down power structure. Yeah. But I, I guess at a certain point in the lifespan of a decentralized uh, unit, uh, those roles must be taken on in order to, to expand. Yeah. Thank you so much. Good evening. Raise this a little bit. Uh, my name is Simon Rivers, and uh, I'm here uh, speaking on behalf of many staff and faculty of the University of Michigan. Uh, that's right. Um, Congressman Lewis, you are a hero to many of us here, including, including me, so um, thank you all for being here tonight. Recently, the University of Michigan administration decided to consider allowing a prominent white supremacist whose, whose name I will not utter, I won't uh, give him that satisfaction, uh, the university decided to allow him to speak on campus sometime in the future. Um, a decision that many university community members disagree with. My question is this, how do we react or respond? Do we engage in protests or do we just simply ignore his hatred? Well, you know, in a university, a public space, people have a right to speak, right? The right to protest, the right to speak. Dr. King said from time to time, the time is always right to do right. So I would advise the students and the university community, whatever you do, do it in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion. Listen. The university is supposed to be a place of learning, debating, but never try to silence someone. People didn't want us to march from Selma to Montgomery. There were people who didn't want us to march on Washington. There were people who didn't want us to sit in. There are people didn't want us to take over the floor of the house on gun violence. But we did it in an orderly, peaceful, non-violent fashion. And I think you sent a strongly 
message. And sometimes when you have hate groups and others, sometimes silence is best. You can send a powerful message. But as I said earlier, whatever you do, do it in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion. Thank you, sir. And you will have the victory. Thank you, sir. Just a bit ago, we were, we were discussing this, and I think you made a very good point about organized white supremacist groups learning lessons from and employing tactics and strategies from, well, from the left throughout, throughout history, uh, but specifically tactics which were really crystallized and used to their best advantage throughout the movement. It's important to recognize that when choosing what to do, but also to recognize within that, within the role within the strategies of the movement, understanding that relationship to media, understanding how strong PR and media access is for the white supremacist right. Mm. And so definitely take into measure, in a lot of ways, it is a lose-lose situation, but trying to minimize a certain level of press, which is immediately weaponized, really in either case, uh, regardless of outcome. But I think because, you know, living in Indiana, I'm going to find out about, you know, how things unfold in Ann Arbor, thanks to media coverage, uh, is to recognize that, like, the waves that this, that, that any action or counteraction leaves will be determined by the coverage of that event, and recognize that already at this stage, organized white supremacy works very hard to weaponize that even before there's a public movement, before there's a plan, before space is booked. It is an information war. It is a media war. It's a PR war. And so recognize that those are weapons, and they're powerful weapons, and use that, use that wisely, both in protest and in constructive action. Can, can I just make a further point? During the Freedom Rides in May of 1961, when we arrived at the Greyhound bus station in Montgomery, the Freedom Riders were orderly, peaceful, angry mob started first beating members of the press, the reporters. So if you had a notepad, if you had a camera, they beat you, destroyed the cameras. And then they turned on the Freedom Riders. These are members of the Klan that beat us, left us bloody. But if it hadn't been for the press, the civil rights movement would have been like a bird without wings. Yeah. I just, Andrew, you wanna do something that seems like you're eager and anxious? <laughs> <laughs> Look, they're trying to provoke the campus the way the movement provoked Bull Connor, or the way the movement provoked Jim Clark. And they're using the tactics in reverse. And they're well-educated and they're well-informed but the difference is, is that 55 years ago, the white supremacist was governor. Mm -hmm. so, I didn't say he was president. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, there's a, there's a phrase, there's a, there's a portion a couple times in March where it says that um, violence met with nonviolence spends itself quickly. And I think what we're seeing is a concentrated effort to go around the country and try and find a target, somebody who's willing to step up and be hit, right, to pick that fight. And um, I mean, I have this really terrible thing that my mom used to say to me, when a kid uses a dirty word, so I can't say it. But the gist is, is if somebody is, is giving you guff, don't catch it. You know what I mean? We'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. My name is Serena Varner, and I'm a senior at Washtenaw International High School. <laughs> um, on behalf of myself and fellow classmates here, I'd like to thank you all for your work in being here. It's an honor to share this space with you. Um, reading the March Trilogy, some of my favorite portions were of the specific 
glimpses that we got into your life, especially as a child. Um, some of the simple stuff, like you living um, on a farm and um, preaching to chickens. And I thought that just showed a lot of your humanity. And so with reference to that, my question is, how do you feel about the way we discuss the civil rights movement in schools and outside? Um, more specifically, I feel like figures such as yourself um, are spoken about in a heroic manner. And while um, the change you have pioneered is undoubtedly deserving of admiration um, and gratitude, I'm curious to know if this pedestal that we put you on through this glorification ever makes you feel separated or isolated from humanity, um, just on the other end of the spectrum. Well, I, I grew up in, in like an ordinary poor child and came under the influence of Dr. King and the action of Rosa Parks, the Little Rock Nine, and um, I just tried to help out. I call it something, this may be historian, probably call it something else. Mm -hmm. But of course, sometimes the spirit of history just pick you and say, you go there or you go there. You say this, you say that. You speak up, you speak out. And sometimes you have to let it lead you. But I spent many hours, uh, Andrew would tell you, people in Atlanta would tell you also, that children, little children, I go to school for elementary school kids. I get down on the floor. I get on my knees and talk to them. And they ask me a lot of questions. A lot of these young people read March. They heard stories. They watch films and the video. I just talk to them and say, you too can do something. You too can make a contribution. I'm going to schools in Atlanta elementary school would look like the United Nations. People all background. And sometimes I said to myself, I wish Dr. King can see Atlanta now. So, so we all can, can do something. We all can just be a little more human. So that's what I try to preach and live. Just be human. Thank you. Be like, the chickens taught me a lesson. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to tell some of the, I said, you be, you be still, stop fighting. And uh, I preached to them. And when one would uh, die, we would have a chicken funeral. <laughs> and, uh, <you> know. <laughs> Take it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Help me up, Andrew. <laughs> so, so, no. so, all right, this, sometimes he does feel himself. He'll, he'll call you and he'll be like, I was so good last night. <laughs> and, and, right? But then the next time you call him, you'll be like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm at Publix. They have better fruit here. <laughs> Or, or he'll call him and it's like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm playing with my cats. <laughs> so it's, it's that, right? And I think he deserves that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for being here again. Like everyone has said, we're super grateful that you were able to make it today. Um, I'm Kyra, I'm a junior. I'm um, studying public policy at the Ford School. I'm doing a concentration in education policy, so I wanna try to provide you know, opportunities for all children like myself um, to be able to achieve at their highest potential. And so um, I was thinking a lot about like how social movements and our activism on campus um, and even like our activism just in our everyday lives, in our neighborhoods, um, how those are influencing change at the policy level, how um, you and your colleagues in Congress um, inform your work by what we do and how we're protesting and how we're speaking out, if at all, or if that's completely separate from what we're doing on the ground here or whether those two are ever in concert with each other. You're you two are much younger than I am. <laughs> um, you're closer to this young lady age. Why don't you two? 
<laughs> so, do you want to go first? I don't work in DC. <laughs> well, let me, let me, let's parse the question first. Um, look, uh, DC's tough right now, right? It's real it's tough. It's really tough. Um, it's, it's another world. Her. Yeah. <laughs> I guess this is my 11th year on the Hill. And yeah, you can see it in my face. It's, um, I'll give you, look, my, my mama, my mom passed in June. And, um, she, one of the things that she was really worried about for me is that I was getting too hard. Something would happen to her, somebody would do something on her land or something like that, and I would call them up, I'd read them a riot act, bring in lawyers, whatever it took. They were just smushed. <laughs> and the way things are in DC right now, that seems to be the only way you can survive. It's, it's, not, it's not even about, do we have a good dialogue? It's, can you avoid the mortar fire? Can you avoid getting crushed as a, a piece of collateral damage from somebody's personal vendetta that's been carried on for 10 years? And that's not what statesmen do. And this country is not run by statesmen right now. But I think this is what makes John Lewis, this is what makes the civil rights movement, this is what makes nonviolence and the understanding of nonviolence so important for this day and age. Is that the path forward in Washington in particular is going to be one in which we all have to take a very difficult look in the mirror and be honest with ourselves. I see people who came to Washington who don't believe in government. Why are you trying to be in government if you don't believe in it? Government is meant to be a force for good, for us all to pool our resources and build a community where we are all taken care of. If you don't believe that, you should not be in government. And I hope it goes that way. But some, sometime I'm talking with some of my friends and colleagues in the Congress, and I said, no, Brother Paul, your mother didn't teach you that. Where you get it from? <laughs> Andrew would tell you, one thing I've been doing for the past few years, taking members of Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, Progressive, liberal, but also conservatives. Back to the historic site of the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. Been taking them to Birmingham, mm -hmm. to the church where the four little girls was killed. Mm -hmm. To walk through the park where Bull Connor used the dogs and the fire hoses. Mm -hmm. To take them to Montgomery, to Dr. King's old church. Take them to the spot where Rosa Park was arrested. Mm. Take him to the old Greyhound bus station where we were beaten mm. on May 20th, 1960. To take him across the bridge in Selma. Some of them come back renewed. But we have to take people back. Sometimes they have to see and meet some of the people that struggle. It's an ongoing effort to make us all better. Mm. Andrew is right. Yes, you're right. <laughs> My name is Michael. I'm from the wonderful Youth Arts Alliance. <laughs> um, first off, I would like to say thank you, Mr. Lewis, for your role in the civil rights movement. And I would like to say thank you to you too for bringing awareness to it. Um, my question is, as a biracial young male, how can I use these unique qualities to fight against racism and discrimination today? Well, when you see people put down because of their race, their color, speak out. So that's not right. That's not fair. 
So that's not even being human. I come from a, a religious background, and I happen to believe there's a spark of the divine in all of us. And we don't have a right. We have not been ordained to abuse the spark of a fellow human being. So you live your life, and then so living your life by your own presence, by your own being, you're saying that I am who I am, that I've been created in the image of the divine. <coughs> that is about to happen in, in England. We're about to have a biracial princess. That, that's right, that's right, that's right. That's right. Thank you, sir. So it's okay. So I'm okay as I am. I'm human. And don't let it get you down, brother. <laughs> Keep picking them up and putting them down. Okay? Well, this is, this is an important concept from nonviolence, which is the, the idea of education and sensitization. This is what I was talking about earlier, growing my beard, right? A lot of us can pass. But really, we have an obligation to live our lives as loudly as possible about all the things that people don't see on a usual basis. Because if I go to work and someone says, oh, why, why did you do that? And I'm like, well, because my father's Muslim. My father was a Muslim immigrant. I wanted people to know I'm sort of sticking up for it a little bit. It's just my little thing to start the conversation, right? I'm educating and sensitizing people. The, the first reactions I always got was like, oh, really? Oh, but you're a good one, right? <laughs> How many of y'all got that one? Right? Right? But, but that's just it. These are people who've never, they've never known a Muslim immigrant or a child of a Muslim immigrant, and they just go with what they see on the t uh, My mom says, the TV. Uh, <laughs> and that's, 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 at its core, the most simple thing you can do is simply live your life out loud and let people know who you really are. And by that, educate and sensitize the people around you so that your example as a person of conscience, as a person of morals, informs their perception of what you unfairly or fairly, mostly unfairly, come to represent. And you have to almost speak for your people. I didn't even know my dad. I don't know the first thing about being a Muslim immigrant. But that's my dad and that's my name. And so I have to speak up for it. And you have to do the same. Thank you. Christina, how are we doing on time? Christina has left us. <laughs> one more. One more, okay. Last question. We have one more question. Oh. My name is Garrett, and I'm also with the Youth Arts Alliance. Go, Garrett! <laughs> uh, <Yeah! laughs> no pressure. Right. No pressure. Is, uh, and Mr. Lewis, I was wondering, is what you went with, through with racism affect the way you see white people today? Let me hear your question again. Is what you went through with racism affect the way you see white people today? Well, I don't have any, um, any bitterness or uh, any hate. I don't hate anyone, or dislike anyone because of what I went through. Some people think maybe I should be bitter or hostile because I was left bloody during the Freedom Ride in Rock Hill, South Carolina, again in Montgomery, Alabama, that almost died on that bridge. But I, I was just trying to help out. I, I put myself in the way. Uh, I got in trouble. Good trouble, necessary trouble. And I'm proud that I took a stand. So I have friends, um, some are black, some are white, Asian American, Native American. Um, they're my brothers and sisters. But I think racism is a disease. I think some of the social scientists are saying that. And maybe people in psychology are saying that. 
And we have to sort of rid ourselves of, of, of the feeling, the attitude, the hate. And I think the movement, in a sense, people say we're stirring up things, creating trouble. We were bringing it to the top, to the surface, so we could deal with it. And we must continue to do just that. But we need people who would lead, on top of lead in high places. People who would get out front and say, that's not right. That's not fair. That's not just. And be leaders. If you come and visit my office in Washington sometime, when you're there, when the March on Washington was over, President Kennedy invited us down to the White House. He stood in the door of the Oval Office. He was beaming like a proud father. He said to each one of us, you did a good job, you did a good job. And when he got to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he said, you did a good job and you had a dream. He led. President Johnson re responded to what happened in Selma and made one of the most meaningful speeches in an American president that made in modern time and the whole question of civil rights, of voting rights. He was the first American president to close the speech by saying, and we shall overcome the theme song of the movement. Leaders must lead. Leaders must be headlights and not tail lights. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.